Okay, so without further ado, let's introduce today's panelists. We're joined today by Marco Polo's director, Damien Ma, Senior Technology Advisor, Paul Triolo, who's also the practice head uh, of geotechnology of Eurasia Group, and also our fellow, Matt Sheehan. And just yesterday, Matt published a brand new research on the global flow of AI talent, and I will be copying that article to the chat window as well. So I will now hand this conversation over to Damien. And remember, if you have any questions you want them to answer during the Q&A, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of your Zoom, and I will be collecting these questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Holly, and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening in Asia. If you're up in Asia, uh, that's a real commitment. We appreciate it uh, at midnight. Uh, so as Holly said, if you missed our first uh, Decode China Zoom it was on the uh, post-COVID Chinese economy, and it's uh, the whole video is on YouTube. You can you can find it and watch it, watch the recording if you like. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about something completely different. And as you heard, we're going to be focusing on artificial intelligence. And it's just great and terrific to be talking about it with Paul and Matt, two of the foremost experts on this industry and the landscape of it. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to think that there's still some general confusion out there about what AI really is for a lot of people. Uh, I think AI is an easy acronym, but it's actually very complex and broad. I feel like people think it's just Skynet and Terminator type of stuff or robots taking over the world. Uh, but I think in reality, at least today, it's really a, a bunch of complicated algorithms training computers uh, to do you know, human-like, specific human-like tasks. Um, it's actually something that's extremely hard to do and achieve, and it requires top-notch uh, scientists and researchers. And that's where we're, we're gonna begin today the human intelligence behind our intelligence. Uh, and then we're gonna explore and then talk what we call the whole stack of the AI ecosystem, including hardware companies and kind of the, de uh, the development ecosystem that's, uh, that's burgeoning around the world, but particularly in China. Uh, and so talent, uh, uh, we would argue, is one of the most important pieces of the AI ecosystem. Um, as far as we know, you know, AI is uh, a lot of that research is collaborative and, and open source. So there is already a lot of knowledge transfer, but I think transferring human capital is a little bit harder in, in theory. Um, and uh, I think we believe it can really determine a country's AI capabilities. And so as you heard from the top from Holly, we have a new, a new product out that, 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 tra that, that tracks the global, um, the, the, the global talent flows of, of, of people doing AI research. And I think there'll be some, some really, uh, really interesting insights. And I'm just going to turn it over to Matt to discuss uh, the findings of a particular study. Great. Um, thanks, Damien and Holly. And, and thanks, everybody, for joining the webinar. This uh, product that we launched yesterday, the Global AI Talent Tracker, is really the, the sort of culmination of kind of two, work, two years of like foundational work, kind of laying the sort of intellectual foundation, testing out different models of this, and then the last six months of, of really intense, almost mind-numbing uh, data work, gathering really in-depth granular data on top-tier AI researchers, slicing and dicing it 100 different ways, sort of validating it against other data sets. And that all sort of culminated in the product we launched yesterday. And I guess the, you know, the reason why we put so much time into this, why it's been, you know, my full, full time job the last six months and, and a huge part of my work the last two years is because I think it's really important, more important than ever that we try to ground our sort of policy conversations or our industry conversations about AI in some really well-grounded assessments, frameworks, and ideally data to validate those. I think uh, beginning in about 2017, the, at the time of the Chinese national AI plan in July 2017, sort of the policy conversation around you know, US-China AI competition, uh, where do the two countries stand, that the intensity and the volume of that conversation got way out ahead of sort of our actual understanding of the issues. Where do the two countries stand? Where does America's strength come from? Where do its advantages lie, et cetera? And I feel like we've kind of spent the last three years trying to catch up on that front, trying to sort of put together the building blocks of understanding to say, okay, these are the inputs to an AI ecosystem. This is what goes into the US ecosystem. This is what goes into China. And then trying to ground those building blocks in data so we can really be standing on solid ground. 
And while this product that we launched yesterday is uh, by no means the final word on this, I think it is one of the most sort of comprehensive uh, granular looks at specifically the research category on this. And so I'm really happy to be sharing it with all of you. So I'm going to share my screen and kind of walk us through that uh, the product visually and then kind of the methodology and some of the results uh, relatively quickly and then we'll have plenty of time for conversation. So this right here is uh, the Global AI Talent Tracker. It is, I'll sort of give a little bit of methodology at the very beginning and then sort of quickly go through the rest. So this year we gather data on one of the top, if not the top AI machine learning conference, uh, one that specifically focuses on deep learning on neural networks um, called NeurIPS, Neural Information Processing Systems. Um, it's one of the biggest conferences. It's one of the most selective conferences. And this year it was bigger than ever. So they had about uh, 16,000 researchers submit papers with an acceptance rate of about 20%. And what we did is we gathered data on that on the authors of accepted papers, the researchers behind accepted papers, and then tracked their sort of entire educational and career trajectory to date. So knowing where did they attend undergrad? Where did they go to grad school? Where do they work today? What company do they work for today? Is it public or private? And, and a bunch of other uh, parameters for each researcher. So the, the goal here was to map not just the balance of AI talent today, the AI research talent, but also the flow of it from one country to another, from undergrad to the present day. And with this data set, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, what type of AI talent is important? Is it, you know, low level engineers? Is it the most elite genius researchers? And what we sort of opted for was a bit of a middle ground, but leaning a little bit more into the high end research category. We, we define this group as top tier AI researchers, approximately the top 20%. And we think that this is the most important group because they, while they're pushing the theoretical sort of boundaries of what we know as, you know, worldwide, what we know and what we're able to do in terms of machine learning, these are also people who have the ability to apply that often to highly complex real world problems. So that's kind of the background for it. I can answer more questions on the methodology as we go, but I'll start with sort of the key visual takeaways. So we're trying to answer where does AI talent come from? Where does it work today? In terms of where it works today, the answer is relatively clear. The largest country by far is the United States with almost 60% of global top tier AI researchers currently working for US institutions. China is next, but it's uh, almost one-sixth of the U.S. at 11 percent, followed by Europe very closely. I'd say China and Europe are, are essentially tied on this front, and then a couple other countries that come into play. But I think the more interesting picture in a lot of ways is this one on the right-hand side. It's where do top-tier AI researchers come from? And here you see the U.S. share goes from 60 percent in terms of where they work today down to 20 percent. That means that essentially 20% of the researchers in our data set attended undergrad in the US, using that as a rough proxy, imperfect, but the best we have for country of origin. So USA at 20%, and here China really shines, 29%, uh, almost one third of the researchers in our data set did their undergrad in China and then went abroad and ended up working often in the United States. So there's plenty more detail to go into on these sort of headline charts and, and the takeaways, but I'll leave some of that for discussion. So I want to highlight one uh, visual aspect of the research that I think is kind of one of the more uh, striking aspects of it. So I'm just having a bit of trouble shrinking the screen the right amount to make sure we can see this. There we go. So this is a, a Sankey diagram, which essentially shows flows over time. I'm, I'm not sure how smoothly it's coming through on the screen share. Um, but what this essentially shows us is on the left side category, we have undergraduate education. In the middle, we have graduate school. And on the right, we have uh, post-grad work. So these are people who have already graduated from their master's programs or PhD programs and gone on to work. And essentially what you see is the US share between these three uh, effectively triples. Here, the, the, the proportions are, it doesn't appear to be a full tripling because this data set of postgrad work is smaller than the graduate school work because a lot of these researchers are currently in grad school. 
But what you really get to do here is you get to poke around and, and follow these flows over time. So uh, by say clicking on the post-grad work, you get to see where does everyone who feeds into the current US uh, AI capabilities come from. You see a big chunk from the US, a big chunk from China, then all of these streams from a whole range of other countries, from India, Europe, Iran, South Korea, um, all feeding into graduate school in the US and then the vast majority of them choosing to stay on afterwards. Uh, similarly, you can click on a country in this middle tier right here. For example, if I click on China, that'll show you where the researchers who do grad school in China where do they come from and where do they go on to work? So for example, this one is relatively clear. Almost everyone in our data set who, did research, who went to grad school in China comes from undergrad in China and the large majority of them go on to work in China. A small portion go on to work in the US. Um, if we look at a country like UK, you get a bit more of a sort of a, a convergence and then a divergence. You see the UK taking in uh, graduate researchers from a whole bunch of different countries and following that, they kind of spread out to uh, countries around the world. So this, you know, I really encourage you to log on to the website and play around with this. Um, you can see, you know, you can cut it a million different ways. You can see where Chinese researchers, where pe researchers who start in China, who do their undergrad in China end up, making it very clear that more of them go to grad school in the U.S. and more of them end up working in the U.S. than stay in China. So that's a clear win for the United States, I think. Um, after you have time to play around with that, we sort of go into spin-off questions below. I'll try to keep this relatively brief as I don't want to uh, just read a bunch of pie charts for you. But we, we essentially take a whole bunch of more granular cuts at the data here. We look at, for example, what portion of uh, research papers at NeRIPS involve international co-authors, co-authors who uh, went to undergrad in different countries, we look at the stay rates of Chinese students in the U.S. and international students in the U.S. I think this is maybe one of the more striking figures from the study. I think a lot of people, including myself a few years ago, were very you know, concerned about the idea that a lot of Chinese uh, AI researchers, they come to the U.S. for grad school, they pick up all these skills, and they head back to China afterwards and apply them there. But at least among this group that we're looking at, top-tier AI researchers, essentially the top 20%, if they attend grad school in the U.S., they uh, overwhelmingly stay here to work afterwards. Um, I think that speaks a lot to the strength of the U.S. research ecosystem, to the fact that if you want to pursue really long-term cutting-edge research, China is still uh, can be a bit of a tough place to do it. There are institutions, Tsinghua, Beida, Peking University, um, but the U.S. has this whole range of companies, universities that offer you an environment where you can pursue that research. And that sort of institutional breakdown is clearest at the bottom here, where we mapped the top 25 institutions at this conference with the overwhelming majority, I think it's 18 of them, uh, are being US universities and companies, and China only showing up twice, with Tsinghua University here and uh, Peking University down here. Europe has a few uh, appearances, as do uh, UK and Canada. But there's a ton in this report. There's tons to unpack. I won't try to walk through all of it here right now. I really encourage you to log on to macropolo.org and click through, play with the uh, project yourself, and go to the methodology for a lot of details. I'm happy to answer questions on those details as well, um, not just about the methodology and how we came up with this, but also the policy implications. So I will stop it there, and I'll hand it back over to Damien. Thank you, Matt. And before I turn to Paul, let me just uh, uh, prompt you with a few uh, questions and, and then we just take a few minutes and then, and then we're going to go to the full stack. Um, but looking at this, I wonder if you can, and I know that there's a lot more granular, uh, granular data coming. I, I wonder if you can preview, uh, you know, uh, Europe a little bit because, you know, everyone's focused on U.S. and China, obviously, but it's clear also that Europe is not, no slouch there either. So if you could just say, say a few words about kind of uh, you know, kind of the European side of things. I, I, I think that would be interesting. Sure. Yeah, we do have essentially this, yesterday we launched the main report, but over the coming weeks, we're going to roll out a series of sort of deep cuts on it, um, what we're going to call Dig Deeper, where we do say, you know, a handful of charts just looking at Europe or just looking at Asia or, or other questions like international collaboration. And doing the Europe ones, I think, 
What really stood out is uh, number one, France. France was the big winner of breaking down the uh, the European sort of the contributors to the European share here. It led in terms of undergrad country for these top tier researchers. It led in terms of current country for these top researchers and it led in sort of the most elite slice from our data set. We had both this sort of top 20% and we have another proxy for basically the top 0.5%. And France was the number one contributor to Europe across all of those categories. Um, some other ones that were in there were Netherlands, Switzerland, and uh, Germany shows up uh, sort of a cut below those. Um, so I'd say that was kind of my country takeaway. Maybe the other takeaway would be that US, overseas U.S. research institutions play a big role in Europe. Um, I will have to double check this, so don't quote me on it. But I think something along the lines of one third of the top tier research that is physically done in Europe is done at U.S. institutions in Europe. Um, but again, uh, wait for the dig deeper. Let me clarify that for sure. But that was definitely something that jumped out that um, and, you know. uh, and, uh, uh, and UK is out of it because we did this uh, post Brexit, right? So we didn't count UK as, as part of Europe, right? Obviously. Correct. UK, um, I believe would be above, uh, France and, and all those countries if we were to factor it in. So just two quick, small questions, and then we're going to, uh, uh, pivot to the full stack. Uh, you, you talked about, I think one of the questions, and you're right about the chart about the kind of 88% of, you know, stay Chinese uh, researchers stay. Uh, but can you elaborate a little bit about how, how you guys looked at kind of the stay rate, the average stay rate? Can you just talk a little bit about, because uh, I, I do think, you know, there's a lot of questions about that. Sure. Yeah. So uh, stay rates can be, and stay rates being basically when you, when you finish undergrad or graduate school in the U.S., um, are you, do you continue working in the U.S. right after graduation, five years out, 10 years out, et cetera. And historically for PhDs, the overwhelming majority of them have stayed in the U.S. And I think the concern over the last seven, eight years, well, people really start talking about it, say the last four years, um, has been, are we training Chinese researchers who then go back to China and apply those skills? Um, there's been great research uh, by uh, the National Science Foundation and the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown, both looking at granular at stay rates for uh, top tier STEM students. And they've found that that sort of narrative of the return to China has not held true and our data uh, very much supports that. What we, I think, sort of the interesting thing that, that comes out of our data is we are in that number, that 88% is an average across recent graduates. Uh, people have been working for five to 10 years and people have been working for 20 plus years. Essentially, we're looking at all of the Chinese researchers in our data set who went to graduate school in the United States. Are they currently working in the United States? And so you get kind of this, this average picture over time of all these different groups. And it, it held up across all the groups that the average was 88%. So I'd say from a, um, from a sort of US competitiveness perspective, that's a very, uh, that's a very good sign. That's very positive. Um, but it also reveals sort of how much is at stake right now with a lot of the current policy proposals around banning Chinese uh, STEM students, uh, you know, ending OPT for OPT being the, the program that allows recent graduates to stay and work in the U.S. for a few years. So, yeah, very good news for the U.S., but raises the stakes on how much we could hurt ourselves. Uh, and, and the last thing is you uh, on the institutional rankings, uh, you know, Tsinghua seems to be kind of the AI talent factory in China, right? They, they do some, they, they just keep on producing, uh, you know, top tier AI researchers and Beida too. But beyond the kind of the big two off the top of your head, are, are, are there any other Chinese universities that, that have, you know, solid AI programs? Uh, or are, are there ones that are, that may be catching up or, you know, or, you know, we just don't know about them yet and they may emerge in the next five years? Yeah. So the, the, I'd say the big other one would be the University of Science and Technology China of China. USTC, which uh, I'm pretty sure is in Hefei, um, in Anhui province, that has been a, a powerhouse of China's uh, tech ecosystem for a very long time. And they showed up as one of the top sort of uh, sources of AI talent. What we showed there, the institution ranking is, where are the researchers today? But actually, when we looked at where do the undergrads come from? Where do the undergrads who go on to be top tier researchers come from? Tsinghua was the top university globally by far. 
um, and other universities in China, USTC, uh, Peking U, also appeared very high on this on this list. Whereas sort of U.S. universities, it's much more dispersed across uh, across the whole country. Got it. Anhui, huh? I mean, that's the that, that's the home province of uh, former President Hu Jintao. So I'm, so I'm sure he's he, he might be proud of that too. <laughs> All right. Can I from, just from add Hu something Jintao. there, Damon? Damon? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, oh. I, I think it's I I tend to come at this from sort of the commercial side, more you know the Chinese companies that are that are doing AI maybe rather than the R, the R and D side. And my sense in talking to a lot of people in China is that they're blown away. This is and this is talking to some CEOs or lead tech guys at companies on the ground, and they're recruiting all over China. And they're really blown away by the quality of, of the students, at, not just at the big name universities, but all across the board. Um, and, and the competition, right? It's very competitive uh, for the top tier people that are studying math and science, all the sort of underpinnings of AI. Uh, and they're, and they, they, they're, they give people tests. They go out and recruit, and they give people really tough tests you know, at conferences, and then they recruit people right there. Uh, but their, their sense is that you know, across the board, there's, there's a, there's the quality is pretty high. So even though you have to look at it at these individual universities, there's a lot of second, third, and fourth tier universities in China that, that are producing very high caliber uh, students that and a lot of those go right into the commercial companies, for example, they may not go necessarily go on to right away to grad school or other things. Um, so it's a pretty, so, pretty so Paul, so Paul, uh, Paul, that that's a great segue into into kind of the, you know, your side of things, uh, talking mm -hmm. about commercialization, talking about the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to let's talk about the hardware. Let's talk about yeah. the chips. And the, sure. uh, which is we, 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 we hear a lot about chips, but we also want to talk about the development environment. Sure, and sure. Uh, what's what's been happening on the China front? Sure, great, great question. I think maybe it would help to just quickly sort of cover some of, uh, build on what Matt, Matt says. I, I'm really eager to, to dive into that that model, but what a fantastic um, uh, product there. Um, I think it's important, and Matt sort of alluded this at the, toward the end there about sort of US policy on this and how it's evolving. So I think, um, you know, this, Matt mentioned this sort of AI arms race meme, and I think that's, that's a really critical thing to note here because it explains in some sense US policies um, that are related to companies involved in AI. And so, you know, there is this sense in Washington that we're in this zero sum game with China for the technologies of the future and AI and quantum computing and, you know, and 5G and semiconductors are all there. So all these things are at play. So, so, so some of the hardware and software issues also get, get dragged into this. Um, and, you know, you have also have on the talent side, people like Tom Cotton saying, you know, why are we letting Chinese st students study AI and quantum computing here? They should be studying the Federalist Papers. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so some of those issues that Matt raised, are, I think, are really going to be crucial going forward because those numbers that, that he cited are people staying. You know, the, we see a, certainly an increasingly hostile environment in the U.S. in terms of broadly for Chinese students and particularly for STEM students. So I think that's important. And you know, there have been these efforts, uh, really good studies on the part of the U.S. government, the National Committee for AI, National Security Committee for AI, put out a study, and they acknowledge that there's this big. China nexus in terms of talent that that you don't want to really mess with that you know without understanding the full implications of that for U.S. companies and for you know sort of U.S. AI more broadly. So I think that's important. And then finally, there's this broader issue um, around you know where, where the U.S. is on sort of uh, 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 AI governance and AI safety and security globally. Just just last week, the U.S. and NASA was going to join the G7 AI effort. And again, some of the rhetoric around that by Michael Kratzios at the White House is very much, you know, we're going to join the G7 effort, and this is sort of directed at China, right? That, that we want to form this like-minded group of companies or countries, and we're going to we're going to jump onto this um, bandwagon there. And so China is sort of a little bit the odd man out here in terms of sort of at a, at a sort of government level on this. But meanwhile, of course, in the commercial sector, um, you know, there's there's there, there's so much going on in China. I think quickly when we think of AI. Uh, and this was part of Kai Fu Lee's paper that uh, uh, that I work on and uh, with the team before the great book on AI superpowers that, that Matt worked on. Um, and in that book, you know, uh, and, and in the paper, the, the discussion was around the four really the big areas around AI. So you know, sort of internet AI when you popping up all the ads that to, to, based on your browsing history, and then there's the business part of AI, um, things like logistics and leveraging uh, data sets that, that businesses have. Uh, you know, financial data or logistical data, uh, and China is very good on, of course, on both of those. And uh, and uh, and then the third one is perception AI, things like facial recognition, object recognition. Of course, Chinese companies are very good there too. Um, and then the final one is autonomous AI, uh, and that's things like you know leveraging multiple sensors and multiple things uh, in terms of 
you know, real human-like decision-making around things like autonomous vehicles. And there, of course, the, the sense is that China's lagging there a little bit um, and, and that, that the U.S., those companies have, have a big lead there. So, so when we talk, we get into sort of the, you know, what, what is, what's going on in China in terms of commercially and the AI stack, I think it's important to just to have those in mind because, you know, they're already companies like Alibaba and Tencent, I do, they're all leveraging the sort of internet AI. Um, they're, you know, they're training algorithms in the cloud and then they're, and, and, you know, they're, they're leveraging those for their business operations. So there's very, there's a huge emphasis in China on this practical sense of AI. We're going to leverage, you know, smart algorithms to help us with our business. Um, and again, a lot of researchers in China go into those companies because they want to work for really good AI, uh, you know, pioneers. So a lot of the big companies and even some of the smaller second, many second tier unicorns in AI are headed by guys who studied in the US, worked for big US companies, Google, Microsoft, and then went back and, they're, and they're, they have a really good reputation because they're really leaders you know, in, in, in AI. Uh, and, and then the, the researchers in China wanna go and work for those companies. So the, there's a sort of a company uh, uh, element there that you know, maybe when you look at that list of, of AI uh, research organizations, you, know, you have Tsinghua, but you could maybe put Alibaba and Tencent and Baidu and, and you know, Horizon Robotics in there also because you know, there's so many um, Chinese companies that have, have had a really um, good uh, luck in terms of recruiting really top people because they have some, some very senior people that are well known in the field in general. Uh, so when we look at sort of the, the stack then, right, I mean, you have, um, obviously there's sort of the application side at the top, but before you even get there, you have this, the, the, you have the, 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 the hardware part of the, of, the, of, the, of the equation. And again, that's another area that's, that's sensitive to US-China relations and things like export controls. So last year we had eight Chinese AI companies, all leaders in, in, in facial recognition and other object sensing and natural language processing, all being slapped with this entity list action. And so they're, they're even right, even as we speak, trying to figure out, you know, how do we acquire uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs that we need to, to do training in the cloud, for example. So, the, the big thing, of course, is GPUs. So people talk a lot about AI chips. And really, you know, we have, we've had this long evolution. GPUs were around for a long time. It turned out that the math kinds of stuff they're good at crunching uh, is really good for AI. Um, and so really in that area of sort of cloud-based training of AI algorithms, you really are you're really talking about NVIDIA and, and AMD uh, and Intel, right? I mean, they're all sort of providing that the sort of processing capacity in the cloud. And there's really no... There's really no Chinese equivalent to that. So almost all Chinese companies, big, small, you know, teeny, they're all using likely Western processors for their for their cloud-based training of algorithms. And that's just sort of, you know, that's just the, the way it is right now. Now Huawei, for example, has has developed its own processor, the Ascend 900 series, and and that's sort of designed to, to compete there. But, you know, it's not just about the hardware in this case, it's about the, it's the, the, the companies like NVIDIA provide a whole lot of software support around those GPUs to optimize things. They work with companies to really, depending on the application, to really optimize that. So, so there's no real equivalent to, to, to NVIDIA right now. So for the foreseeable future, that's, that's, that's going to be the case. And so therefore, U.S. efforts to control that technology are going to impact Chinese companies in a big way, um, depending on how those are implemented. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the other piece of it is the edge is the edge, and so the edge is big. And in China, there's lots of companies trying to get into the edge side of things. So this is you know neural network uh, accelerators and processors, um, and this is this is for inference at the edge. So you've trained the algorithm. Now you're now you're getting out there uh, and you're doing this. And these are really high, highly optimized uh, chips, also that are, you know for things like power efficiency, because you really care about how much power you're using at the edge. Um, and when you look at that, there's sort of two markets. There's the consumer side, right, which is you know, your iPhone, facial recognition, and, and other things maybe running on your iPhone that are not that particularly compute heavy, if you will. They're just sort of, they're, they're dedicated to a single function. The real, the real money is going to be in the sort of high performance um, dedicated chips that are going to be like for autonomous driving, um, that are, that are going to be doing a lot more than, than, than one function, and they're going to have to be really high performance, and again, that power efficiency. So think of like, I, I just had my Tesla 3 uh, hardware upgrade, and they and the, the hardware upgrade went from from an NVIDIA chipset to a, to a, to a proprietary Tesla chip, uh, an AI engine. Right, that's, that's, there's two of them on the, on the board there, and that was developed by by Tesla um, uh, to because they have very specific needs about the compute power at the edge of the network on their cars, um, and that's a good example. They're taking video feeds and a whole bunch of stuff into, and, and they're figuring out you know the situation and where of the car. So. I think what's 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 happening then is there's a sort of a migration from these really high performance GPUs off the shelf to these to the to systems on a chip 
um, that are highly integrated and optimized and power optimized. And so, you know, in China, if you look at the things like the AI development plan, you know, if it's and other development plans. I mean, they, they talk a lot about trying to develop a Chinese chip that can compete with NVIDIA's latest, you know, latest offering in the GPU space. Um, but that's going to be really tough in the long term. So I think a lot of effort has gone into to Chinese companies looking at that uh, at the edge. And if, so if you look at the edge, there's tons of players. There's Huawei, there's Alibaba is jumping in here. And Alibaba and, and, and some of the big players were also looking at, at that, at, at sort of the cloud-based training part of, of the equation. Um, and then you've got companies like Horizon Robotics and Cambricon, Intellifusion is another company, uh, Yi2 and Flame. Um, and they're all de designing some, the, these, these edge semiconductors. And a lot of them are fabbing them at TSMC in Taiwan, which is of course the same. So a big, another topic about, about you know, whether uh, TSMC will be allowed to fab chips for Huawei, including that Ascend series I mentioned, which is still under, under doubt. Uh, and they're also using co companies like Global Foundry. So basically in China, there's a lot of effort to sort of break into that edge market um, and, and sort of, um, you know, be, be, be competitive. And, you know, that's an area where I think Chinese companies could, could uh, and those, some of the smaller companies could, could end up competing. There's a great paper that- So Paul, so Paul uh, sure. going back to the companies, uh, so Paul, Okay, go ahead. Uh, just going back to your mm -hmm. thing about come beyond kind of the big players at the Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei's mm -hmm. in the world, both in terms of, you, you mentioned the hard side, but what do you think are interesting companies in terms of that are doing interesting AI applications uh, in China that are, that, that are already applying AI to a lot of, you know, commercial purposes or other types of uh, use cases, sure. uh, things, companies that we may not, I mean, I think you mentioned Horizon Robotics, but are there others that, that kind of not, that's not sure. really on, our radar yet that you find yeah, interesting? Yeah, well, if you look at, there's a good rating of sort of the top 50 companies, AI yeah, companies in China, and you've probably never heard of most of them. You know, so it depends on, on the sector. So you have companies like iCarbon X, which is doing a lot of stuff in the medical arena. So when you talk about sort of the sectors in China, obviously the first, a lot of funding uh, initially was around sort of public security and surveillance and facial recognition. And so there was a lot of money flowing into that. But the next wave is probably going to be in the medical area, although it's really tricky there when you start getting into business models. But there's a lot of Chinese companies, um, iCarbonX comes to mind, so it's a really important one, um, that's looking at things like medical imaging, you know, imaging of, of lung cancer uh, tumors and that kind of thing. There's a tremendous amount of even in VC money going into that. And Matt can certainly comment on that. Um, so I think, I think um, you know, there's a lot of second tier companies that are in that space. And then there's companies like Maylong. You may not have, have never heard of Maylong. Maylong is doing object recognition. So they're, they're pushing very much into the consumer space. So they're looking at, you know, smart vending machines. So you go to the vending machine, you take out a product and it'll automatically detect what that product is. Um, if you replace it, it'll, you know, sort of debit, you have an app on your phone and it'll debit that. So they're looking at, at, at sort of interesting consumer applications because there's a big also a push into the consumer space in China. Um, we're using AI for things like, you know, designing clothes and other things. And Maylong, Maylong is one of the companies that does that. So there's a lot of really interesting areas in China, particularly in the consumer space and the medical space, where a lot of these apps uh, are going. So, uh, so a, a question for the both of you is at the corporate level or even at the institutional level, I know that there's Chinese researchers here, but just in terms of, uh, are there, is there actually a lot of uh, collaboration going on at the corporate level between U.S. and Chinese companies or between U.S. institutions, Chinese, you know, so sort of below whatever the national level is, uh, you can call it subnational or you can call it entity based. Is there sort of, you know, talent, top tier talent in America kind of collaborating? Uh, I, I don't know what, what that looks like. I don't know if there is something that's, there. That's a great question. You want, you want to jump, Matt, you go ahead. I, I have some thoughts on it too. Sure, yeah. Um, at the corporate level, so uh, first maybe looking at the research side of things that, uh, that the big data set is on. At the corporate level, you don't see a lot of collaboration between companies in the U.S. and China or companies in the U.S. and other companies in the U.S. You don't have Facebook and Google collaborating on a ton of AI research. In the U.S., you see more uh, you know, corporate and university collaborations. You see a lot of like Stanford, Google collaborations. Um, you know, uh, maybe NYU, Facebook collaboration, stuff like that. Um, but at the company level, yeah, the researchers are not going to be working together. And I think when you get outside of sort of the uh, explicit R&D high-end research phase, you know, I think we, uh, everybody's a bit in retreat from these relationships. These might have peaked around 2017, 18, when you see, you know, Google and Tencent pairing up on sort of IP sharing. Uh, there was a lot of speculation about Alibaba and Facebook, you know, pairing up to so as a counterweight in some ways. 
but I think at this point, uh, you know, the, the, how to put it, the chips are on the table. It is clear that if you are a big American technology company, it is not in your uh, political interest to be seen as partnering with a Chinese company or really an institution. Yeah, and I would just add things like MIT and iFlytech is another good example where, um, you know, you had, um, You've had a lot of U.S. research institutes that have collaborated with Chinese companies, but in part because of the entity listing last October, now you have a real reputational issue, uh, at least in that space, um, with any kind of collaboration, whether it's at the corporate or other level. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when I talk to people in China, it's th th their view is, you know, there's, there's no U.S. company in China that's, do that's really, you know, competing in AI, right? Because, I mean, all the big players, Google, obviously, uh, and Facebook and some of, and Amazon, you know, they're, they are, they do have some limited cloud services offerings in China. That's a big topic on the, in the trade discussion over cloud because they have to have a joint venture partner. Um, and, but they're not really competing in, on specific applications. Although, you know, their cloud offerings do include AI uh, and related uh, interfaces, you know, application development, uh, application interfaces. So, so they're, they're, they're trying to compete there, but I think it, it's such a, it's kind of a sensitive area. So I think that, um, you know, Chinese, there's a, in China, most of the, the businesses that are going into the cloud that might utilize those are going to use Alibaba and Tencent and their AI offerings uh, more than, than, uh, than Google or, or Amazon uh, in particular. So there's not a lot of collaboration there. Up until recently, I mean, there have been a big research presence in China. Microsoft, of course, Future Data is all there in some sense. Um, and Google uh, uh, and, and is also uh, has, has had a research, has a research center in Shanghai. But there's very little... I think those those efforts are probably really low key, um, and there's a lot of concern that U.S. export control laws, for example, could uh, extend into things like deemed exports, so that you might have to get an export license to send a researcher from Silicon Valley to, to, to you know your your research effort in, in China. So a lot of companies are really sort of um, gun shy in terms of really uh, expanding their their any kind of research heavy duty research on AI in China. So I got one final question in the interest of time, and I want to turn it over to the audience and the attendees. Kind of a broad question again for the both of you. I mean, you're, uh, Paul, you're in DC, Matt, you're, you're much closer to, to Silicon Valley, and we talk a lot about whatever, you know, decoupling at the national level or in various aspects, or at least that word gets bandied about a lot. But there also seems to be maybe not decoupling, but certainly dissonance between kind of the East Coast and the West Coast. Do you on a close to these issues, what, whether it's talent? So I wonder if, Paul, you can weigh in on kind of, you know, why that is, what with the DC and, and how kind of, the, you know, the Valley thinks about these issues. And we'll, and we'll turn it over to yeah. audience questions. Sure, just, just quickly, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I think there is this sort of meme in DC that, again, that sort of, you know, you throw in military civil fusion in China, and the perception, again, is that, that any kind of collaboration or any kind of, um, uh, any kind of U.S. technology sales to China is eventually going to benefit the military. And the flip side of that then is Chinese students coming here and, and gaining from an, uh, our education system are going to go back to China and make Chinese military stronger, right? So that meme is very strong in D.C. Now, now that's not, of course, U.S. Com US technology companies in that space don't necessarily <laughs> buy into that agreement. I think one example I'll cite, I'll just say quickly, is when, when the U.S. Commerce Department was trying to come up with a list of emerging technologies to control that came out of the whole export control reform act of reform in 2018 uh, they first put out all these things these algorithms and a whole a long list of ai related technologies and the industry was like how do we even think about controlling these because a lot of these are in development they're in r d a lot of them have been open sourced for a long time um, and so there was a huge pushback from industry on this and basically what happened earlier this year is the first rule came out on that but it's very very narrowly tailored it's basically using neural network algorithms uh, for object recognition in the geospatial context, right? And even that, if you look at the definition there, it's a little bit tortured because that could still be used for commercial purposes, right? But there is, there's a more understandable military application there. And so industry could, can, can accept that. But that just illustrates the, the, the difficulty here because AI is, you know, it's, it's applications, it's, it's R&D, it's all these different things, development environments, hardware. And I think nobody has a clear sense in DC, particularly what should be controlled and what's, what's gonna, what should be allowed, because you wanna encourage this very, you know, this very um, collaboration and which benefits like you at the US AI community at the R&D level and benefits US companies at sort of the hiring and talent level. So the, the debate in DC has gotten a little more sophisticated, I would argue, in the last year, um, but there's still a long way to go. And the tech community, Matt? Yeah, I would say, 
so sort of my time frame of looking at this is I was in China 2010 to 2016, started spending a lot more time in California starting around 2014 and moved back here in 2016. And at the time I was, you know, really you know, spending all my time mapping these connections between uh, China and California, and specifically Silicon Valley and China. And I'd say in those first maybe two, almost three years that I was back, 2016, 17, 18, this gap, this dissonance that you are talking about was, uh, you know, overpowering. It, you talk to people in Silicon Valley, there was just a, um, a, a absolute rejection of the idea that DC had anything to say about uh, technology, about, you know, the uh, rejection of the idea that sort of US policy concerns or geopolitics should factor into their decisions as a technology company. And, you know, the, the dissonance was incredibly strong. I, I remember I kept thinking at the time, I, I, in China, I always felt like my job was, you know, I got to make China and America understand each other. I got to get them on the same page or get them to understand the motivations of the other. And when I moved back here to California and then spent more time in DC, I was like, oh man, the real project here, I got to get DC and Silicon Valley to understand each other. They're totally talking past each other. Um, but I'd say over the last, what are we in now? 20, mid 2020? Yeah, the past year and a half or two years, you've seen some real movement and change here in Silicon Valley being much more open to uh, sort of you know, having DC as part of the conversation mm -hmm. here, being much more aware of a lot of the, you know, problems, ethical problems, uh, political problems, or, you know, business problems that come with different kinds of entanglements with China. And yeah, you've seen a, a, a major shift in that department, whether that's because, you know, people out here sort of saw the light and, and came around, or just because they realized that DC has the ability to force them to come around. I think that's that's a bit up for debate, but I would say there has been a lot more convergence between DC and Silicon Valley over the last two years. It's still a, a wide gap. The, you know, the conversations out here specifically around, you know, restricting Chinese researchers and stuff like that. People out here, uh, frankly, think that's uh, crazy and very counterproductive, but um, on, on other issues on, on uh, sort of how, how to think of these technologies as sort of strategic geopolitical tools and assets, I think there is a fair amount of movement here in Silicon Valley. And with that, uh, you know, we got 15 minutes and we want to make sure we address some of your questions. I see a bunch already in, in the Q&A and, and Holly has been curating them and uh, we'll do our best to run through as many as we can. Obviously, not every single one, but uh, Holly, I'm going to turn, turn it over to you for the Q&A. Great. So I've seen a lot of questions about the methodology of Matt's new project. So I will just screw them together. I think a lot of a lot of people are curious why you choose to use data set that you use, and um, you know why don't you use multi-year data for the conference? Uh, why don't you include other conferences? Or there's also another question that asked, how about using the most cited AI papers in the past ten years as a data source? So can you comment on that? Sure. Um, so just to reiterate, especially if anyone came on late, the, the data set that we're using in, uh, in the Global AI Talent Tracker is uh, researchers at NeurIPS 2019, so maybe the top AI conference uh, out there today, certainly the top conference on deep learning uh, out there today. And so in choosing this, we kind of looked at a bunch of different dimensions, and there's sort of the issue of a time series. How do things change over the time? There's the issue of the sort of breadth of conferences. Why not use two conferences or four conferences or 20 conferences? So I'll try to address these kind of one at a time and then citations. So on time series, uh, we're basically working towards that for the last, now we have three years of data on the sort of very top papers at NeurIPS, what are the papers selected as oral presentations. And that's about 40 papers each year. So we've uh, charted that in 2017, 28 for the 2017 conference, 2018, and now 2019. Conference is always in December, so it's still relatively recent. Um, so we have three years on this kind of most elite category, what's roughly the top 1% or top 0.5% of AI publications out there. And that's, we're going to continue tracking that. Going forward, we will continue to track the uh, NERIPS, sort of the general population, the much larger set, data set of about 1,500 papers. So that sort of time series element is coming. It just, we gotta build it up over time. Um, on multi-conferences, this, this is something we thought about a lot. There are 
a couple other metrics out there that have uh, done sort of a data scraping method to gather data on more conferences. So they have kind of a wide breadth um, of papers involved. What they don't have is the depth of data on each researcher. So we, we think that in a lot of ways, it's very important to not just track where are these researchers today, which can be found out with just scraping, but where do they come from? And that is a lot more manual, a lot more data collection. And so for the time being, we prioritized that depth over kind of breadth of conferences. What was very encouraging is that we sort of compared our results about national level country shares of uh, the papers with a couple other comparable studies of more conferences. So we looked at another study that looked at NeurIPS and ICML, sort of the other top uh, neural network or deep learning focused conference. Um, and our results, so our results for just NeurIPS mapped almost uh, identically onto the results for NeurIPS and ICML, uh, all within the margin of error there. And we also compared it to another larger study that looked at 21 conferences and then which, you know, at that point, you're not looking at just sort of the top tier researchers, you're, you're really getting down to the middle and maybe even huh. about the, the mid tiers of AI research. So it's not directly comparable on that front, but they, that uh, study also developed a metric sort of combining citation counts with conference selections to come up with their top 18% of researchers. That's sort of the closest comparison to our data set on top 20%. Um, and again, the numbers were really strikingly similar, all mapping almost directly onto everything sort of within the margin of error. So we feel pretty good about generalizing within this sort of top 20% that uh, the results hold whether you use just NeurIPS or you use a number of conferences. So that's good, um, very kind of encouraging for the results. In terms of citation count, that's really the big divide among people who try to use research papers to assess AI capabilities. When people use citation counts, they're usually drawn a much, much, much larger uh, body of work. They're, they're using online databases to draw in, say, 2 million AI research papers published over the last 20 years. And I guess our take on that is that, uh, that really, a lot of the papers in that data set are, are not really relevant. They don't really represent um, what we're trying to get at here, which is kind of the researchers who are sort of really ready to contribute. Um, I do capture something in terms of sort of the engineering talent that goes into AI. A lot of those sort of low end papers, they're not going to contribute on the research level, but they might go out and become sort of a, you know, a regular machine learning engineer for, you know, a, a mid tier AI company. So I think the citation counts are, are can be valuable in that sense. Um, they're also a little bit more subject to gaming of the results. Uh, a lot of papers that are survey papers get a ton of citations because they're an easy site. A lot of papers that are sort of the only paper in a sort of narrow sub niche get a lot of citation because they're a, uh, an easy site. And you, especially in China, unfortunately, you have a, um, a practice of uh, inflating citation counts by sort of, you know, everyone, everyone in a research group cites each other because there are uh, monetary incentives for that. So that uh, I'm going through that relatively quickly. You can read the methodology. It kind of laid out all these comparative studies at the bottom of the methodology. So I encourage people who are interested to check that out. Uh, Paul, you're on mute, Paul. Yeah, just a real quick follow-up. I mean, I also, you know, when I talked to a lot of people in China, I mean, obviously the Chinese researchers tend to, and from companies tend to go to some of the more applied kinds of conferences, right? Like computer vision, so ICCV, um, tends to have a big Chinese presence there. So is there any sense in your, you know, compared to say to some of the more theoretical and are, you know, really basic R&D stuff, um, Chinese tend to, tend, to, tend to go to those and com particularly companies. Is there any sense in, in, the, in the research where you've taken into account that or is, is there a way to sort of, you know, factor that in so as you look at sort of citations because clearly there's an emphasis on applied um, AI um, in many, in, within China, particularly in the commercial level. Yes, yeah, so the, We've there. There's some publicly available data on leading computer vision conferences like CVPR, and while it doesn't get very the published data doesn't get very granular, it does appear that Chinese researchers have a significantly larger presence at say yeah applied computer vision ever or not everyone knows but um, the computer vision is maybe China's strongest suit in AI generally speaking, and you can. Uh, Imagine what the applications of computer vision and facial recognition are in China. Uh, they're not always, uh, we don't always love all of them. Um, so in terms of the computer vision, that's one part. 
the study that I was speaking to where it sort of used 21 conferences and then selected the top uh, 18%, that did include a lot of applied conferences like iClear and ICCV and stuff like that. Um, so I'd say it does generalize across that population. One could argue that maybe applied papers don't get that many citations necessarily. Um, so there could be a bit of muddling in there. But yeah, I think for me going forward, the next phase of this research is to try to get zoom in, stop talking about AI or machine learning, broadly speaking, but say, where do the US and China compare on natural language processing, on computer vision, on robotics, et cetera, and just kind of drilling down and getting really specific. Great. Um, let's also, let's look at other questions. And just a FYI, if your questions weren't addressed during this webinar, I already uh, copy and pasted this Twitter link in the chat window. You can uh, you can directly ask Paul and Matt your lingering questions under this Twitter under this tweet, and uh, they will be available for twenty minutes after the event. So the second question, I think both of you can speak to it is. Um, can you speak a bit more to the pipeline of AI talent that is supporting China's domestic AI industry? To what degree is China facing a talent shortage? And beyond potentially seeking to attract overseas students or researchers back to China, what policies are happening in China to support its AI talent, talent pipeline? Or to what degree is China reliant on talent that has studied or worked abroad? Uh, so that's like five questions. Holly, why don't we just sure. lump in, why don't we lump in uh, just uh, trans questions? Basically, that question is about the state of, you know, yeah. uh, China AI brain drain and, and what that looks like. Holly, why don't you lump in two more? We don't have to, we don't have to answer every single component of that question, I don't think. Uh, are there two more so we just kind of end, end with the last three? Uh, sure. We have some specific questions addressed to, um, let me see. So there's one question, if the Trump administration starts to block Chinese scholars with military links from coming to the US as promised, what impact might that have on the AI ecosystem here? And we also have a question that asked, this person is interested in seeing if the current USA immigration policy will divert talent to Canada or other countries in this case. All right. So basically, two questions. One is the state of kind of Chinese AI brain, you know, brain brain problem. What would that looks like for both of you? And then sort of the general, uh, you know, uh, immigration decisions and how that might affect uh, the whole idea of talent and flows. Sure. Anybody, well, one of you can go. Well, let me jump in first, and I'm sure Matt has a lot more to say on this. Um, on the sort of domestic scene, I think there's no doubt that China is cranking out a lot of talent. So I would say there's no there's no real shortage in China. And again, it depends on on what you're talking about, because I think there's a huge pipeline of Chinese talent that's going right into the commercial sector. So the commercial companies are serving in some senses R&D uh, factories, right? I mean, they're, they're bringing in people right out of with a graduate degree, under, even under, they're really good undergraduates in this, in this area. They're bringing in undergraduates or graduates into, into a company and then they're getting on the job training there. And that pipeline is very robust. I mean, I don't, I don't when I talk to people, I, I don't hear of any shortages. I think the tricky thing is though, is that, from the, and from Matt's study there is, you know, is that, that pipeline of that's going to the US for, for higher education and then coming back. And I think that gets to the second question, which is, you know, is that gonna change radically under, you know, under this new administration policy that's looking at, at targeting STEM researchers in fields like AI. Um, so that, that, that could change that dynamic, I think considerably. Although I think my sense of course is that Chinese students really wanna come to the US and study. If you just look at the numbers of, of universities that have programs in math, and, all the supporting elements of AI, you know, they're still, it's huge. And, and, and in China, there, as I mentioned, many good uh, universities, but it, but, the, but a US education in these areas is still highly valued and that's not gonna change. Um, so I, I, we hope that, 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 that these uh, more extreme policies that are being considered will, will, will be ratcheted back. And I think US schools are very much concerned about this also. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I broadly agree with all of that. I'll just chime in on the military questions. So this is in relation to the Trump administration saying it will uh, block visas for grad and post-grad researchers with uh, links, with uh, affiliations with universities who have links to the Chinese military. With this, um, 
we really don't know what the impact will be yet because we don't know how they're going to define links to uh, the Chinese military. Um, if they define that very narrowly, uh, sort of universities are military universities with a, that type of tight connection, then that's probably not going to have a huge impact. Um, if they define it very broadly, as in any university that has had any partnership at any point in time with a military affiliated institution, then it could be very broad and have a much larger impact. You know, it'd be the same way of when you think of U.S. universities that uh, have links to the military, do we include all of the Ivy League and top tier universities that have had some type of a DOD partnership or have taken money from DARPA or something like that? Or do we define it more narrowly as those who have like really deep collaborative relationships with the U.S. military? That would be my take on that. All right, let's squeeze in one final question. We got one minute. So let's, let, let's find a simple question to answer that'll take 30 seconds each from, from, from Paul, Paul and Matt. Uh, let's, let's just take one more. We got a minute. Okay, um, let's just take this one question that's directed at Matt. Um, how does Silicon Valley see China's thousand talent program and similar talent programs like that? Um, I think that the uh, thousand, in my opinion, and what I get out of conversations with people here is the thousand, the thousand talents program, which is China's attempt to um, provide financial incentives to bring researchers, uh, Chinese researchers predominantly back to China, that the impact of that is, um, is, is pretty overhyped. Um, I don't, uh, you're, if you're a leading edge AI researcher, or you're a really ambitious entrepreneur, you are not going to base the decision on where you live and work on a subsidy of say $100,000 from the Chinese government or their offer to, hey, we'll set you up with a nice apartment uh, at a nice university in Hubei province. You know, the, that's not really the kind of marginal difference in the decisions of, uh, of people who are sort of really ambitious and really making an impact. So, yeah, I tend to think Thousand Talents is a bit overhyped. It, it probably is more influential in bringing that. Maybe you're a kind of a mid-career Chinese professor who's you know spent 15 years in the U.S. but doesn't like dealing with the bureaucratic politics of an American university or something like that, and you decide to go back to a Chinese university, which probably has way worse bureaucratic politics, honestly. Um, I that that's the main thing where I've seen an impact. If somebody say you know mid career, maybe they're even kind of past their most productive years, and they want to retire to China or they want to go back to China because their parents are there or something like that. And Paul, yeah, the last add, word. Yeah, Paul, yeah. Paul, the last word. Yeah, I would just add that's really a good way to end it. Is that you know Matt's point is really well taken that that if you're a top AI researcher in China, you can go anywhere in the world, right, and and apply your trade. So that's something that's I think people don't don't realize. And that, you know again, that's a small percentage of people, but those are the those are really the leaders in the field. And and those those guys you know they they want to go to the valley, they'll go to the valley. If they want to work back in China because the conditions there are better and it's getting hostile in the U.S., you know they'll go back to the U.S. They'll probably retain you know they might retain a house and a family. Family and, and other other purposes in the valley, um, but they're they're sort of part of that global you know tech elite, and they can they can go wherever they they want, and, and there are more and more of those kinds of um, like researchers. And, yeah. Well, Paul, Matt, uh, thank you so much. This has been a very enlightening and lively lively discussion of a very timely and obviously will continue to be a very important topic uh, for for both of our countries and also the world. So we're going to end it here for now, but we. Uh, please join us. And Paul, Matt, I hope you both will join us on, on continue 20 minutes of a Twitter live discussion so we can answer some of your questions that did not get answered. Uh, but we appreciate your time and we hope to see you next time on the Decoding China Zoom webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Damien. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.